To understand how primary groups shape human beings, let's look at some pre-modern images of group life that reveal primary groups in their sort of natural settings of traditional society. The images that follow come from Russian peasant paintings of the 19th century and then the, a remarkable series of paintings uh, uh, created by Peter Bruegel uh, the Elder and Peter Bruegel the Younger uh, in the uh, 16th century in, in, um, in Brussels. So primary groups have, again, small size. Um, most of the people or all of the people in a primary group know each other personally and intimately and have known each other for a long time. There's also an expectation in primary groups that the membership will not change very rapidly. Hence, you have an expectation to be around the people in a primary group forever, or at least for the rest of your life. There is, again, a, a, a much tighter connection between self and society in primary groups than what you would find in secondary groups. The self is merged with society in primary groups. One psychologically identifies oneself with the group rather than with some um, rather than with one's own biological husk. Now in class we talked about Emile Durkheim's distinction between egoism and altruism. Egoism literally means selfism or I-ism. It is a psychological emphasis upon the sort of reality status of the individual self. An egoist views him or herself as reality and views all other human beings as essentially unreal. An altruist, on the other hand, views society as more real than the self. Altruism is a psychological focus upon the welfare of others, on the welfare of the group, the welfare of society. An altruistic person will engage in self-sacrificing actions to help the group survive. Primary groups have this kind of altruistic quality. So primary groups often depend upon this kind of tight identification between self and society and a willingness on the part of individuals to give of oneself for the group in order to function. Contemporary workplaces and bureaucracies lack that kind of high level of emotional and psychological identification and they require uh, inducements like rewards, pay, um, uh, tightly controlled regulations in order to get people to Primary groups aren't like that. You work because you identify with the group, you contribute because the group is you and your life. So when we look at these images from 19th century Russia, this is what we, we see are people who are working together, coordinating pretty effectively without rules and regulations that are specified by law without contract because of a shared identification as part of their primary group. Let's look now at Peter Bruegel's image of the harvesters. Uh, this picture demonstrates the relationship between individuals in primary groups. One of the qualities of primary groups is that you actually are members of essentially one and only one group. The primary group is the world, the social world. Hence, the people that you work with are also the people you tend to live with, they're the people you're related to, they're the people you worship with, they're the people you celebrate with, they're the people you grieve with. Again, multi-sided relationships. So in Peter Bruegel's paintings of peasant life in pre-modern Europe, you see people who work together, relax together, love together, um, uh, celebrate weddings, go to church together, fear God together, all of these things. So again, this image shows that kind of multi-sided quality of primary group life. Simple, local living, relatively small groups, but multi-sided and complex relationships between the members of that group. So traditional societies, work and life isn't segregated. Family and work group and worship group aren't segregated either. Primary groups have a tendency again to touch on all sides. The same idea is contained in this image of harvesting in Russia from the 19th century. 
and again, a kind of multi-sided richness, a kind of intimacy, eating, sleeping, reproducing with the people you work with in a tight community that has been in existence for many generations and that has an expectation to continue for more generations as well. Again, multi-sidedness, uh, uh, high levels of emotion, high levels of emotional variability, um, uh, experience of others in multiple occasions, not just at work, but at home, not just at home, but at church, not just at church, but in, uh, in, in parties, that one really sees others in all sides of life, and they see one self as well. So in these kind of intimate communities, where one's life is lived almost entirely surrounded by a cocoon of others, the self doesn't quite develop as an individual, but rather the self remains tied to the group. I and the group are one. The group has more permanence and more durability than any of its members, hence I identify closer with the group than I do with myself. Again, this image from, from, from uh, dancing peasants, again, showing them, giving themselves up to group life. Um, so, again, even though this Russian image from the 19th century shows a, lo a lone young woman with something like a sense of self, um, again, the small size, the local quality of interaction, the primary group as the originary of all social life, um, um, prevents that kind of emergence of individuality. The uh, famous line from Hillary Clinton that it takes a village to raise a child is reflected here in this image. Um, the high levels of work required from pre-modern peoples, working many, many hours in order to meet the basic needs of life, meant that children were often raised by elderly people or by uh, those who weren't able to fully participate in social life or in work life in other ways. Imagine yourself to have grown up in this village. You would have known all of the other children from your earliest memories. You would have known other people in the community from your earliest memories. You wouldn't view yourself primarily as a child of uh, two parents, but would instead view yourself as a community member. But in traditional society, your parents are only one of a number of uh, people who uh, do care, and you identify then with the broad group as a whole. So again, this traditional village life uh, relatively small scale, relatively intimate, all sides of life being co-experienced together, an identification of the self with the group and the group with the self. In Durkheim's writings, as we'll talk about later and as your textbook talks about, um, altruistic suicide, killing oneself for the good of the group, is, um, is possible in traditional societies and it may well be one of the most common forms of suicide in traditional societies. When you closely identify yourself with the primary group, the perpetuation of the primary group matters more than the perpetuation of your own biological husk. You don't care if you die, as long as the group continues to exist. This attachment to group is linked to the willingness of warriors in tribal society uh, to go to war and to embrace the death of the self for the survival of the group as a good bargain.